There are five learning objectives in Chapter 6. The first is to explain why people take the risk of entrepreneurship, listing the attributes of successful entrepreneurs, and describe entrepreneurial teams, entrepreneurs, and home and web-based businesses. The second is to discuss the importance of small business to the American economy and summarize the major causes of small business failures. Three, summarize ways to learn about small business operations. Four, analyze what it takes to start and run a small business. And finally, number five, outline the advantages and disadvantages small businesses have in entering global markets. Let's start our slides in traditional fashion by naming that company. The founder of this company opened a candy company in Chicago, but it failed. He tried again in New York, it failed again, but he didn't give up. And today his company is one of the largest candy companies in the world. Um, so what you'll find is when you're starting a new business, you don't give up so easily. You just keep trying and try again just like the founder of this company, Milton Hershey. Um, so obviously everybody probably knows of a Hershey bar. So just a little information there. And if you're really interested in Milton Hershey and him developing his company, the History Channel has a really cool series called The Food That Built America. And he actually highlights the Hershey company and how it developed and some of its competitors, how they developed along the way too. So if you're interested, take a look on the internet. You should be able to find the episode. It was fairly recent. Do you know of any interesting stories about how some businesses got their start? This slide represents some notable entrepreneurs in history. I think the one entrepreneur that we all know well is Jeff Bezos, who started Amazon by getting his friends and family to invest in his business. Amazon started out selling books, but soon grew to be one of the biggest companies in the world with over 300 billion in revenue per year as of 2019, selling more than just books. I can remember um, probably in the early 2000s, which this is dating me, um, I would say uh, 2003, 2004, and I worked at the University of Cincinnati, and I used to have to order um, certain psychiatry books for the uh, department's chair for research. It was a department of psychiatry. We could find more books there than we could buy in the medical center bookstore. This slide is interesting because it features student startups. There is a more detailed write-up on it on page 145 in the text, but the ideas that students come up for businesses doesn't have to happen after you finish college. Some people start as early as high school and even uh, before that. When you have an idea, start doing your research and working towards being an entrepreneur just like the ones on this slide. For example, Fatima Hussein and Jamie Glover formed a company called ASIA, a line of sports hijabs for Muslim women. Look for opportunity where companies lack in products that don't meet the needs of consumers. Begin doing your research to figure out a way to capitalize on products that some of the large organizations disregard. Can you think of reasons you might want to start a business right after school or while you're in school for that matter? What are the potential downsides to starting a business right away? This slide has the five reasons to start your business right away. You have potential for long-term returns. You don't have a mortgage or kids to take care of. You can survive on little funds and work long hours. There's no disruption to your career path if it hasn't started yet. You're more adaptable and have higher risk tolerance at a younger age. And I will say too, I have a, a younger son that's in his mid twenties and he's always looking for ways that he can grow himself and become his own you know, boss and be an entrepreneur. Um, so take risks. I mean, you can sometimes start businesses with relatively low cost and eventually grow it to be something big. Um, so anyway, think about it. 
On the same turn, you're never too old to be an entrepreneur. More Americans are working over the age of 65, just for a lot of different reasons, whether it's to keep themselves busy, um, whether it's just a need to take care of themselves and their family. Since 1996, older Americans have opened businesses at a higher rate than those aged 20 to 34. Older entrepreneurs have greater experience and more financial resources. Can you think of reasons other than experience and funding that older entrepreneurs are successful? Why do you think older Americans want to start businesses at this age? And what are the downsides to starting a business late? The reason people take the entrepreneurial challenge is because some people like taking the risk of starting a business because it can be scary and thrilling all at the same time. The four major reasons are first, opportunity. The opportunity to share in the American dream is an immend, a tremendous lure. Many people, including those new to this country, may not have the skills for today's complex organizations, but they do have the initiative and the drive to work the long hours demanded by entrepreneurship. Two, profit. Profit is another important reason to become an entrepreneur. Independence. Many entrepreneurs simply do not enjoy working for someone else. They may want to make their own decisions and lead their success or failure. Challenge. Some people believe that entrepreneurs are excitement junkies with the thrive on risk. Entrepreneurs take moderate calculated risks. They don't just gamble. In general though, and entrepreneurs seek achievement more than power. Do you ever wonder why people take the entrepreneurial challenge? Do you know what it takes to be an entrepreneur? You can learn a lot about the managerial and leadership skills needed to run a firm, but you may not have the personality to assume the risks or take initiative, create the vision, and rally others to follow your lead. Such personality traits are harder to learn and acquire than skills like academic skills. So let's first talk about self-directed skills. You should be self-disciplined and thoroughly comfortable being your own boss. You alone will be responsible for your success or failure. Self-nurturing, you must believe in your idea even when no one else does and be able to replenish your own enthusiasm. And what that means is if you fail, you have to pump yourself back up and get out there and keep working. Action-oriented, Have just having a great business idea isn't enough. Most important is a burning desire to realize, actualize, and build your dream into a reality highly energetic. It's your business, so you must be the emotional, mental, and physical able person to keep that business going by working long hours and hard. Sometimes as an employee, we forget that even though we aren't in charge, we do have those weekends to recharge or holidays. But as a business owner or an entrepreneur business owner, Work, it's not out of the ordinary to work seven, 10 days in a row, 18 hour days. So you have to be willing and highly energetic in order to take that responsibility. A tolerant of uncertainty. Successful entrepreneurs take only calculated risks if they can help it. Still, they must be able to make some risk. Remember, entrepreneurship is not for the squeamish or those bent on security. You can't be afraid to fail. Many well-known entrepreneurs failed several times before achieving success. I mean, think about Steve Jobs. He was actually fired from Apple at one point, but then he came back with newer and better strategic plans. And then, you know, they came out with the Apple iPhone and eventually that led to many other successes with Apple. Just because you're still in school doesn't mean that starting a business is beyond your grasp. Many students have turned their time in college into business creation. Um, I have one of the um, employees at our company where I work, she was 
was a student worker. She was going to Xavier full time. She was an intern with my company part time. But then on the side, she also made um, crafts. So, for instance, she made personalized sweatshirts or bags, things like that. And she was able to put herself through college without going into any debt. So that's just an example of how, as a student, you could do that. Uh, she didn't find it to be a long-term solution as far as, you know, working for herself, but it did afford her a great college education. So if you're thinking about it, do you, ha you know, think about ideas for a business. Uh, why do you have this idea? Was there a need um, that you felt like you weren't getting from a business that triggered the idea? Uh, find somebody that is an expert or a mentor that can give you advice and tell them, you know, some of the pitfalls of starting your own business and things to look out for. And then zero in on the specifics. Know exactly what it is that you're going to offer and how it might di be different or better than a competitor. Do your research on campus. I mean, think about all of the different resources you have just in the college library. Test the products with your fellow students. Obviously, make sure you check if that's something that you are going to do. Make sure you check to see what the policies are with the college or university. And then after you've done your research, move forward with that idea. Don't wait, because if you wait, somebody's probably going to come up with the idea and beat you to the punch. Uh, and then also sacrifice. Sometimes you do have to sacrifice. It could be in the form of money, time, um, not as much, when we think about time, not as much time to be with your friends and, you know, be with a lot of family while you're getting your business up and running. And then embrace failure. For me, uh, I'm not an entrepreneur. I guess you could say I am to a certain respect because I have a few side gigs that go on. But sometimes you have to embrace failure because you learn from it. When you make a mistake, you know personally, if you're trying to start your business, how that affects other things. So you go back and you start doing your research, test your product again, um, whether it's with students or not, you know, it, you just gotta figure out what it is that's causing your failure and then come back maybe with a new product, maybe with an improved product. But you can't be afraid to fail because that just gets you further up on the ladder to where, you know, you finally find success. If you really want it, you can work through it. Let's, let's talk again about opportunity. So when you're thinking of taking that entrepreneurial challenge, you want to think about your passions and problems and somehow making them an opportunity for your biz, for the business that you want to start. Most sources of innovations are like a flashlight or a light bulb that turns on in your head. So think about opportunity and whether or not it's good or bad. If number one, will it satisfy a customer's needs? That's one point in the right direction. You have the skills and the resources to start a business. So it's not even a, just about managing the business. Do you know enough about that service or product that you can get started with limited resources on your own. Uh, you can sell the product or service at a reasonable price and a profit. So you really, if you don't have the skill to sit and cost out what your product or services is going to be in order enough or in order to give it the right pricing, talk to a fellow accounting student or a finance student that can help you get to that number and then make sure that it's reasonable enough as far as prices that you can make a profit on, off of it. You can get your product or service to customers before the window of opportunity closes. And this kind of goes back in previous slides where, you know, sometimes an opportunity to sell a product or service, you might be that first one that hits the market. And if you're not that first one to hit the market, somebody else might think about it. So you need to think about how quickly can you turn your idea into a plan and get it out there and get your brand recognized first. 
Not to say that other competitors might come up with the same plan, but as a business person uh, running a company, you have to be able to um, anticipate competitors and know how you can continually improve your product. Uh, and then keeping your business going. So once you've met all those other ideas of good opportunity, um, you have to have good management skills in order to keep that business running and manage your finances of the company, manage your people and so on. Another way that you can become an entrepreneur is by developing an entrepreneurial team. So what that means is you can get together with a group of people with experience in different areas of business, like marketing, um, strategy, finance, and so on, and build that team and create and, and combine your skills so that you have skills in production and marketing to start that business. That way you ensure more cooperation and coordination among different functions. Another way to be an entrepreneur is um, entrepreneurship within a firm, which is called intrapreneurs. That's when creative people who work as entrepreneurs within a corporation, they use the existing resources in order to launch new products for a company. So in order to develop, to develop those new ideas, employees are allowed to work on projects that interest them for up to a specific amount of time during their you know, actual work days. The idea is to support that creative people and ideas in an effort to launch those products. This work can be more motivating than working on someone else's ideas. Some examples might be 3M's Post-it Notes, Apple's Mac computer, or the Sony PlayStation. As we discussed in the last slide, we mentioned um, being the entrepreneur and at using 3M post-its notes as an example. So 3M does encourage entrepreneurship among its employees, requiring them to devote at least 15% of their time to think about new products. So, I mean, you could use this entrepreneur idea with a lot of different things within a company, not necessarily new products, but new strategies to, for the business to keep it um, going for the long term. So another way to tap into that entrepreneurial spirit is by way of micropreneurs and home-based businesses. A micropreneur is an entrepreneur that's willing to accept the risk of starting and managing a business that remains small, lets them do as much work as they want to do, and offers them that balanced work or work-life balance or balanced lifestyle. More than half of U.S. micropreneurs are home-based. Many are owned by people combining career and family. So I guess um, myself, I could consider a micropreneur. So on the side, outside of my regular work, um, I do teach, which that's not really an entrepreneurial challenge type thing, but I also am a notary. So I've used the notary license to become a notary agent to where I can represent mortgage companies and go out and be a signing agent and notary over the documents needed for finance companies. Um, and I can do as much or as little as I want. So typically what happens is I get offered jobs, they pay anywhere from 90 to $100, and I choose when and when, why or how you know, I accept that business. So here is a good example of a micropreneur, a music teacher. A lot of times, along with a lot of other teachers, um, they ended, independently teach people or pupils outside of school. Uh, despite their small business, music teachers can have a big impact on the artistic development of their clients. Could you see why a music teacher or other teachers could be considered micropreneurs? I can because they can choose as many or as little of kids they want to mentor or teach on their spare time. Same with um, a regular teacher. They can choose however many kids they want to tutor outside of their regular school duties and get paid for it. 
In the United States, home-based businesses have experienced growth due to a variety of reasons. One of the most important reasons for growth in home-based businesses is that technology has made it easier for home-based businesses to compete against their larger competitors. There are many challenges to being a micropreneur and owning a home-based business. Some of those challenges are getting new customers and keeping them because you don't have a big budget like you know big corporations. Um, you have to get out there and get your name known by yourself, um, whether it's through social media or word of mouth. It, it can be you know, difficult at times, but once your name's out there, that's when you know you're in doing well and your business is starting to grow. Uh, managing your time. You have to be self-disciplined in keeping up with all of your work, um, doing it timely, and not letting other pressures of home life getting in the way. Um, going into family life, um, work and family, sometimes you can't separate those when you're working from home because you're always there. Um, there are also government ordinances that may restrict your business. Um, so you'll have to make sure that you are doing your research to see what those might be. Um, and then also managing your risk. Um, sometimes homeowners insurance may not cover business related claims. So you may have to look into another kind of liability insurance in order to protect yourself and your personal assets. There are many different types of businesses that could be potentially a home-based business. Um, in your text, it goes over the slide on page 149 if you're interested in you know, some of the things that might be great for your, for your home-based business. The first one that sticks out to me on this list is that personal creation. So um, one of the things that I have friends and then I also do sometimes is making handmade items like um, T-shirts that, you know, have something either specific that a client might want or um, something that you can buy off of a website in order to reproduce. I think that happens a lot and you can see a lot of that out on Facebook's marketplace. A couple of slides ago, we talked about the challenges of a home based business, um, but there are benefits as well. Um, you can start your business whenever you want. Um, you have minimal uh, startup capital. There's no rent or excessive setup charges because ideally you're working with what you have already. Um, you have more comfortable working conditions. So you might have more comfortable chair or be able to sit outside at a table, you know, uh, during the day with fresh air. Um, and then of course, reduced wardrobe expenses. I mean, depending on what it is that you're doing from your home-based business, chances are if you really wanted to, you could be in your pajamas <laughs> as long as you can be motivated that way. Um, no commuting, so last uh, transportation charges. There's also benefits, tax benefits. Um, and of course, you know, the good old elimination of office politics. So you don't have to play games um, with other people or compete with an inter-office situation. And then again, there's low risk for trial and error. Going through the downsides of that home business again, um, you really have to be diligent in establishing your work habits. That way you know that if you make a commitment, you can carry through with that commitment. Um, you have that limited support system. So in an office environment, you typically have other team members that you can rely on. There's isolation. Sometimes for me, I do work from home a few days a week. It's not a home-based business, but I do feel isolated sometimes. Um, workspace might be limited. So if you have a small home and you set your business up, say in your dining room, um, you know, you just, you might have some interruptions and um, not as much workspace as you might in an office environment. And then the other thing is clients might not feel comfortable coming to your home to do business. Um, just depending on the kind of business, you might have to set up another place to meet, like say for instance, a coffee shop. And again, going back to governmental zoning restrictions, you need to make sure you're doing your research on that because that might stop you from having a, a home-based business. 
And then lastly, and most importantly, success is really based on 100% of your efforts. And I can't say that enough. If a type of entrepreneurship that we talked about sounds interesting to you, think about if you are ready to work from home. Um, one of the ways that you can think it through is pause this slide and answer these questions. Um, if you are saying yes to many of these, um, then you might be ready. A multitude of small businesses sell everything online from staplers to refrigerator magnets to wedding dresses and the list goes on. In 2019, online retail sales in the U.S. reached over $365 billion, or approximately 12% of all retail sales. Online sales are projected to climb to $600 billion by 2024. Online businesses have to offer more than the same merchandise customers can buy at stores, and they must offer unique products and services. An online business isn't always a fast road to success. It can sometimes be a shortcut to failure. Hundreds of high-flying sites crashed after promising to revolutionize the way we shop. That's the bad news. The good news is that you can learn from someone else's failure and spare yourself some of that pain. One of the disadvantages of an online business is that it's easy for copycats to find your successful products, copy them, and sell the imitations on other sites. And one of those is, is Amazon. Activity online, both in retail and marketing, continues to grow each year. It's important that businesses, even the small ones, have an online user-friendly presence. This slide provides some guidance to successfully navigate the process of creating an online business identity. Do you have any other ideas for important steps to take in creating an online personality for a business through Instagram, Twitter, ads on Pandora or Hulu? We talked about copycatters in a previous slide. And again, um, just to remind you, um, for small businesses, once they have developed a product and are successfully selling it on Amazon, that's when the copycatters or the counterfeiters will come and sell what we call a knockoff version through a third party vendor. And this actually happened to Kevin Williams, who is um, a Shark Tank um, presenter. Um, and what he had to do, he when he was selling what he called an attachment called Brush Hero, and they found out this copycatting or counterfeiters were going on, he had to actually pay a service um, of a sourcing agent in China to in, ended up discovering that there were five different factories making this copycat brush hero um, and was able to start shutting them down. But if you're interested in reading more about that, and page 151 of the text goes into a little bit more detail on um, the history and everything behind that particular situation. Think about things that the government might do to encourage entrepreneurship. One of the ways was um, part of the Immigration Act passed in Congress in 1990 that was intended to encourage more entrepreneurs to come to the United States. The act created a category of investor visas that allowed 10,000 people per year to come to the US. And if they invest at least $1.8 million in an enterprise that creates 10 full-time jobs, they would, they would um, be able to utilize this benefit. Another way to encourage entrepreneurship is through enterprise zones, specific geographic areas to which governments attract private business investments by offering lower taxes and other government support. They also sometimes call it empowerment zones or enterprise communities. As part of the 2017 federal tax overhaul, the federal government identified nearly 9,000 opportunity zones in high poverty areas across the country. Investors qualify for deferred or reduced taxes if they invest in companies or projects in these communities. 
The government could have a significant effect on entrepreneurship by offering tax breaks to businesses that make investments to create jobs. The Jumpstart Our Business Startups or Jobs Act of 2012 was enacted in an effort to make it easier for small businesses to raise funds and hopefully create new jobs. Um, also, in 2014, President Obama um, announced the creation of these promise zones in which federal agencies help business owners cut through all the bureaucracy and have the ability to get federal grants to start businesses. So when you're thinking about um, potentially being an entrepreneur, think about these potential opportunities and if they will help um, you with starting your business and being successful. We talked about some of the disadvantages of home businesses, um, and one of them was the ability to have customers feel comfortable coming to your home for your business. Um, a way to get around this is um, incubators. So incubators are basically um, an area where people can set up low cost offices to run their services just for this kind of a situation when you know people might feel weird coming to a home. Um, the self-employment assistance program allows participants to collect self-employment payments instead of regular unemployment checks. And we can do this in the combination of private and public sectors. Um, I know the company I work for, we're a global company, but in some of our countries that we represent, we have very few employees. So um, in those countries, we have incubator offices to where um, our people use those offices uh, to do work, but also to meet with clients. This slide basically shows you an example of an incubator office. Um, there is one in Washington, D.C. that offers those offices for new businesses and that also offers basic services like accounting, legal advice, and secretarial help. Let's review. The primary reasons people are willing to take the risk of entrepreneurship are opportunity to share the American dream, profit, the potential to become wealthy and successful, independence, becoming your own boss, and finally, challenging the desire to take a chance. Whereas an entrepreneur has to wear many hats and take huge responsibility, a team allows members to combine creative skills with production and marketing skills right from the start. Have a team that can also ensure more cooperation and coordination later among functions in the business. Most entrepreneurs are committed to the quest of growth in the business. Micropreneurs know they can be content even if their companies never appear on a list of top ranked businesses. Many micropreneurs are home-based businesses. The government helps by creating enterprises and promise zones, offering tax breaks, enacting the Jobs Act, and investor visas. It might be easier to identify with a small neighborhood business than with a giant global firm, yet the principles of management are similar for each. As you learn about small business management, you will take a giant step towards understanding management in general. All organizations demand capital, good ideas, planning, information management, budget, accounting, marketing, good employee relations, and good overall manager know-how. The Small Business Administration defines a small business as one that is independently owned and operated, is not dominant in its field of operation, and meets certain standards of size in terms of employment and annual receipts. A small business is considered small only in relationship to other businesses in its industry. A company may sell 22 million in sales and still be considered small. Another company may have 500 employees and still be considered small. There are over 30 million small businesses in the United States. Since 65% of the nation's new jobs are in small businesses, there's a pretty good chance you'll either work for a small business, 
start one someday or even purchase something from a small business. In addition to providing employment opportunities, small businesses believe they offer advantages over larger companies like personal customer service and the ability to respond quickly to opportunities. Um, as they say, bigger is not always better. About half of the small businesses don't last more than five years. Some of the reasons are managerial incompetence, inadequate financial planning, or even choosing the wrong type of business. There's a more, uh, more in-depth list of failure reasons in figure 6.3 of the text on page 153 if you're interested in, in seeing more of these. But in essence, um, as we talked in other slides or even other chapters, before you do open a small business, do your research. Know who your competitors are. Know who your market that you're going to reach with your products or services. Know that you have the financial backing in order to keep afloat and that you know cash flow is coming through and, and the list goes on. Starting a successful new business is never easy, and many famous entrepreneurs failed at their first and subsequent attempts. You can see them on the slide. Um, think about how a business failure might end up as a positive experience. Um, as I've said in other slides and even other chapters, um, you know, sometimes when you fail, it teaches you not to do certain things over again. It's basically you learn from experience. Um, so think about if your first business failed, would you try again? And why would you try again or why not? Think about also how a business can, sur can survive a, such a bad performance. Um, you see a lot of times you'll see a company advertise on a big sign under new management. You see this a lot in restaurants and small stores, mom and pop stores. Um, they'll put that sign up and sometimes it's enough to get people that left that company to go someplace else um, at, come back and even attract new customers as well. This slide is also in your text, uh, figure 6.4 on page 154. It talks about some of the factors that increase the survival of a small business. And I think the one that really stands out to me is the very first bullet. The customer requires a lot of personal attention, like in a, a hair salon. Um, that's, they're typically always small businesses. Now you might see chains, uh, of, of a hair salon, but they're going to get more personalized um, service from a small salon because, you know, they're the, the small salons, the people that own them, that is their bread and butter. That is the only way they take home a paycheck. So they're going to go above and beyond for their clients in order to keep them and not lose them to those other big companies. How to learn about small business is really using all the tools that we've talked about in some of the other slides. You know, take a class on small business and entrepreneurship, similar to what you're doing, you know, in this introduction to business management. Talk to and work for successful entrepreneurs. See how they lead, see how they strategize. Um, find yourself a mentor. Um, also, if you're looking in a specific field to open a small business, go in on another company and get some experience working in the field um, and then potentially have something on the side uh, to, in order to get your feet wet and see if you're really going to like having your own small business. Or, I mean, you could even potentially take over or buy another small firm. Um, you could serve as an apprentice and eventually get that firm purchased from another another company. You just never know. Um, just do your research. And, and I can't say that enough. 
Um, you, you've got tons of resources. If this is something that you're interested in doing, um, you've got, you can Google it. You can look for information online. You can look at local libraries, utilize college libraries like Thomas More. Um, you've got so much within your grasp in order to do research. Um, obviously, going to the library is not enough. Um, as I mentioned, you know, getting experience in the field is, is important because you want to be that expert as well. And of course, you know, um, just perseverance is always a, a, a big indicator of the success of a small business as well. This is a interesting slide on ethical decisions. Um, it basically is talking about um, people that have worked for a company that they didn't care for the way it was run. Um, so you and a coworker might decide to go out on your own um, and try to open your own company and rather sharing ideas that you have for a new company, um, you are considering quitting your job and trying to get other coworkers to go with you. Think about um, the ethical side of that and you know, not only, you know, trying to steal coworkers, possibly customers, and you know, what are some of the alternatives to, you know, pulling some of that business over? Um, what are the consequences for each of those alternatives? And what is the most ethical choice? Um, I know that there was somebody that worked at my company that um, he was very, he was an executive at the company and he noticed that our company was missing a need of some of our clients. And he quietly um, started developing his own business plan, um, took note of all of our clients, um, took even note of our, our resources that we used to do one particular service. And then he all of a sudden just quit um, left and started his own business. And I think he's been in business for three or four years now. But the problem is, as the owner for the company I work for, he knew what he was doing. Um, and now his reputation with our company is ruined because he used our resources in order to gain the information he needed and even, you know, kind of squatted in on some of our clients. So if you know you hear about never burning bridges well this is one bridge he definitely burnt so um which could potentially harm his business because some of the clients he has now were or still are our clients and somebody could potentially mention the unethical choice that he made before he started his own business before starting a business you should develop a business plan a business plan is a detailed written statement that describes the nature of your business, the target market, the advantages the business will have in relation to competition, and the resources and qualifications of the owner. The business plan is the entrepreneur's roadmap to success. That way, if you get distracted, you can always go back to your original business plan. While a well Design business plan will not guarantee success. The lack of one may lead to failure. To borrow money or to seek investors, a business plan is a must. Rushing into writing a business plan is not a good idea. A good business plan takes a lot of thought and time to prepare. A good executive summary is really important because it's that opening statement that catches the interest and tempts the potential investors to read on. Getting the plan into the right hands is almost as important as getting the right information in your business plan. Personal experience with a product often leads to a person taking the risk of being an entrepreneur and opening up a small business. Um, this slide, I'm not going to read through all the details of it. Um, it's actually detailed in your text on page 156. 
but it, it basically goes over a person that had personal experience in a wheelchair um, that caused a lot of pain in their shoulders and came up with a better idea um, for people in wheelchairs to help um, get rid of injuries. So I guess my take on this is, you know, sometimes the person with that personal experience can make a better product than businesses that have never dealt with the, the problem um, before and they can offer, you know, something unique to customers. A good business plan is between 25 and 50 pages long and takes about six months to write. This slide shows the different sections that a business plan should have. It would have a cover letter, an executive summary, a company background, management team, financial plan, the capital required to open the business, a marketing plan, location analysis, a manufacturing plan if needed, and an appendix. There are many resources for finding finance for small businesses, but the majority of funding typically comes from family or business associates. There's also banks and finance institutions that offer CDFIs, which is a community development financial institution. Um, they typically loan money and provide counseling especially to some of the lower income communities for small businesses. This slide illustrates what needs to be considered before starting a business with family members. Communication and the establishment of clear expectations are key to making a family business work. Why do you think that family businesses might need extra care? Um, for me, it would be because you might want not want to ruin a relationship with your family member if things didn't work out with them either going into business with you or working with you. One reason that businesses fail is the lack of capital. Capital can come from internal sources, personal savings, employees, or from external sources like relatives, banks, or angel investors. An angel investor is a private individual who invests their own money in a potential hot new company before they go public. One source of external funding is venture capital. Venture capitalists are individuals or companies that invest in a new business in exchange for a stake of ownership, and it's typically a pretty high stake of ownership. Many well-known businesses such as Google, Zappos, and Apple receive their first round of funding from venture capitalists. The importance of small business in the U.S. economy cannot be overstated. The SBA, or the Small Business Administration, is the government agency that advises and assists small businesses with financial advice and management training. The SBA microloan program was established in 1991, providing small loans to small business owners. In order to obtain the small business loan, the program judges loan worthiness based on the borrower's integrity and soundness of business ideas. For more information on the SBA, visit their website at www.sba.gov. If you are thinking about opening a small business, uh, you may consider a program called Small Business Investment Company Program or the SBIC. The SBICs are private investment companies licensed by the Small Business Administration to lend money to small businesses. An SBIC must have a minimum of $5 million in capital and can borrow up to $2 from the SBA for each dollar it has in capital. Often, SBICs are able to keep defaults to a minimum by identifying a business's trouble spots early, giving advice, and in some cases, rescheduling loan payments. The best place for entrepreneurs to start shopping for SBA loans is the Small Business Development Center or the SBDC. SBDCs are funded jointly by the federal government and individual states and are usually associated with state and community colleges and universities. 
SBDCs can help you evaluate the feasibility of your idea, develop a business plan, and complete your funding application for no charge. Obtaining money from banks, venture capitalists, and government sources is very different for most small businesses. Those who do survive the planning and financing of their new venture are eager to get their businesses up and running. This slide lists a lot of the different areas for financial assistance with small businesses um, from the Small Business Association. Uh, the, List um, is also in your text on page 160, but the text also goes into a little bit more detail about um, what each type of loan is for and how much um, you could potentially get with those loans. So I encourage you to read those details in the text. If you are interested in other resources for starting and running small businesses, please check out the websites for the organizations listed on the slide. One of the most important elements of small business success is knowing your market, which consists of consumers with unsatisfied wants and needs who have both resources and the willingness to buy. Once you have identified your market and its needs, you must set out to fill those needs. Offer top quality at a fair price with great service. Remember, it's not enough just to get your customers. You have to keep them. And you also have to build that reputation for being a good product and a good managed business in order to um, eventually create more awareness in your market and get more customers. One of the greatest advantages small business have is the ability to know their customers better and adapt quickly to their ever-changing needs. Listen, always listen to what your customer has to say. You'll gain more insight by knowing your customer's needs than relying on your own ego or um, expert opinion. As your business grows, it becomes impossible as an entrepreneur to oversee every detail, even when you're putting in 60 or more hours a week. This means you have to start hiring in order to keep your business afloat. Um, you need to train your existing employees and motivate them. It's not easy to find good people when you, as a small business, offer less than a big corporation. You have less benefits, less room for advancement than other companies do. Um, that's one reason good employee relations is important in a small business. Employees of small companies are often more satisfied with their jobs than their counterparts in big businesses. Um, if you wonder why, um, quite often they find their jobs more challenging, their ideas are accepted more, and their bosses are more respectful because it is so much harder to find good people. Often entrepreneurs are reluctant to recognize that to keep growing, they must delegate authority to others. As you might expect, entrepreneurs who have built their companies from scratch often feel compelled to promote employees who have been with them from the very start, even when they really aren't qualified to be managers. Entrepreneurs best serve themselves and the business if they gradually promote and groom employees for management positions, enhancing the trust and support between them. Some of the most important assistance to small business owners is in accounting and keeping records. Uh, any company needs to be able to keep accurate accounting and record keeping, especially um, to consider your profit margins and you know all of your financial needs. Uh, if you ever try to get a loan, um, having this information is going to be critical for a bank to lend you money. Uh, many business failures are caused by the poor accounting practices because they lead to mistakes. This slide explains the five key mistakes business owners make. The first one is too afraid to commit. They hire the wrong people. They don't want to give up control. 
they become complacent and not anticipate competitors and being able to compete against them. And they fail to use new technology. Uh, for example, hiring the wrong people. Sometimes you, as a new business owner, you think you have to help out your friends or your family, but just because they're friends or family doesn't mean they're the best people to hire to run your business and make it successful. Um, the other big one here is technology. Um, I know a, a small business that it does very well, but they don't invest with their technology. And if they did, the efficiency that it would make with their deliveries and order taking and accounting would save so much time and give them the ability to make a better profit. When managing your small business, um, a lot of times, especially in the beginning, you don't have an expert legal team or tax accountant or uh, an accounting, finance, marketing um, departments. Sometimes it might be inevitable that you have to actually hire an outside contractor like a lawyer or an accountant or marketing specialist. You might even considering um, when we talk about marketing specialists is hiring them to do independent research in order for you to know where to market your product. Um, also, commercial loan officers and insurance agents are real an important resource to have as a small business and developing those relationships also can lead to uh, other opportunities as a small business. Asking good questions is the key to success in any business. Fortunately for entrepreneurs, some of the best advice comes free. For example, commercial loan officers can help with the creation of a business plan as well as financial advice. You can also go to your local university uh, to ask for help developing a business plan. Insurance agents can help new entrepreneurs understand and insure against risk. Um, and another interesting and free source is called SCORE, which stands for Service Corps of Retired Executives. Um, the SCORE program has more than 11,000 volunteers from industry, trade associations, and education who counsel small businesses at no cost. Um, and again, I mentioned um, small or, or colleges helping with financial plans and other small business owners can give advice as well. As you work in this class on your business plan, do a little research on SCORE and see, you know, what kind of programs they offer to see if, you know, the service or product that you're presenting might benefit from it. Let's review. A business plan needs to start with a strong cover letter. The nine key sections are executive summary, company background, management team, financial plan, the capital required, marketing plan, location analysis, manufacturing plan, and an appendix. There are more than 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, which is why it might be attractive to a small business to begin exporting their product globally. Small business exporting accounts for 98% of all exporting firms. Technological advances have helped the growth. There are some hurdles though. Um, they include difficulty in finding finances, not, even, not knowing how to get started, not understanding the cultural differences, which is a big, big hurdle, um, and too much bureaucratic paperwork. Although there are hurdles with global trade for small businesses, there's also advantages. Overseas buyers might enjoy dealing with individuals instead of big corporations. Uh, this is mainly because small businesses can usually begin shipping faster and provide a wide variety of suppliers. They can give more service, personal service and attention. For more information um, and resources on global trade for small businesses, you can look at the Department of Commerce website, um, Bureau of Industry and Security, the 
web addresses on the slide, and then also the SBA Office of International Trade. Um, that internet address is on this slide as well. Lots of helpful resources out there. Let's review. Key reasons why many small businesses avoid doing business overseas include the financing is often difficult to find, would-be exporters don't know how to get started and do not understand the cultural difference between many markets, and the bureaucratic paperwork can threaten to bury a small business. Small businesses have several advantage over large businesses and global markets. These include global buyers often enjoy dealing with individuals rather than large corporate bureaucracies. Small companies can usually begin shipping much faster. Small companies can provide a wide variety of suppliers. And finally, small companies can give global customers personal service and undivided attention because each overseas account is a major source of business for them.